Hello everybody. In this video, we're going to talk about some forecasting methods uh, using time series methods and uh, forecast quality. Last time, uh, we uh, briefly went over this list and discussed which methods were appropriate for which types of patterns in the time series. Today, we're going to start with the first method, which is the naive method. So, uh, the formula for a naive method is this, and let me uh, explain this in uh, some more detail. So, uh, D stands for demand, okay? and F stands for forecast. Okay? Uh, D for demand, F for forecast. Now, the subscripts are time. So, for example, T uh, would be today or this period, current period. Uh, T plus 1 would then be uh, tomorrow. Okay? So, so, what this formula says is tomorrow's forecast equals uh, today's demand. Now, some of you may be very comfortable with this subscript notation, and some of you may not. So let me give you a few examples. So if uh, t plus 2, okay? So instead of t plus 1, we have t plus 2. We just go back one period equals d sub t plus 1, okay? Same formula. We're just applying it to different time periods. If uh, t plus 3, okay? Uh, just go back one period, d sub t plus 2, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the formula says uh, for the following periods forecast, just go back one period. Okay? So let's put in actual numbers. So if I said uh, F6, forecast for period 6, this would be equal to uh, D5. F7 would be equal to D6. We're just going back one period. And then F8 would be equal to D7. Okay? So this is um, simply what this formula means. Okay? So here's a, uh, 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 a time series. Okay? First of all, what is a time series? Time series is uh, time plus data, okay? So here, uh, T denotes time, so period 1, period 2, period 3, so this is T equals 1, T equals 2, T equals 3, T equals 4, etc. So this is the time part, okay? And here, uh, for each period, we observe demand, okay? So here, this would be D sub 1, demand for period 1. And then we would have D sub 2, D sub 3, D sub 4, etc. Okay? So this is basically a time series because it has the time plus the data. Okay. So, I'm sorry about this uh, glare here, but uh, so here uh, we have the forecasts F1, F2, F3, F4, etc. Okay. So, um, and then um, we can apply the formula. We can uh, generate forecasts for these time periods by applying the formula. So F1 equals D0. Okay? So actually, let me um, move this out of the glare a little bit. So uh, this would be equal to D0. Okay? So F1 equals D0. F2 equals 
d1, f3 equals d2, f4 equals d3, etc. Okay? So uh, this is what the formula says. If you want to forecast period 1, go back one period to 0. If you want to forecast period 2, go back one period uh, to period 1, etc. And then, uh, so we can uh, just plug in the numbers here, okay? Because these are demand observations, demand figures, and they're given here, okay? So um, for F1, we need D0. However, D0 is not given. We have D1, D2, D3, etc., but we don't have D0. So we cannot forecast uh, period 1. Okay. However, uh, we can forecast period 2, because to forecast period 2, we need to know D1, which we do. D1 equals uh, 1600. Okay. 1600. And then uh, we need to uh, forecast uh, period 3, F3. We go back one period to D2. And D2 is 2200. Okay. So, uh, F4 will be equal to D3, okay, so uh, D3 is 2,000, okay, and so on and so forth, okay, so this is the simplest uh, forecasting method, this is called the naive method, okay, and um, apparently this method is not the best method to forecast, However, uh, this method is basically like a like baseline. In other words, this is the worst you could do. Okay, but surprisingly, in some cases, the naive method works pretty well, especially if you have a uh, if you have flat line demand, constant level, just minor fluctuations. Um, sometimes the naive forecast works well. Okay. However, sometimes you may think about, okay, uh, this is all good and well, but can we do even better? Or is there a better way? Okay. One thing uh, you can do to improve the naive forecast is to uh, take the average, okay? And instead of relying on a single observation, Maybe you want to take the average of multiple recent observations, okay? And that is called a uh, simple moving average, which is our second forecasting method, okay? So, so this is the formula. Okay, so this is the formula for simple moving average. It's boring, so I'm going to skip it, okay? I'm just going to show you how to calculate it. Okay, in simple moving average, the idea is to take the average of the most recent n periods. So how does this work? Uh, so uh, I just magnified the slide a little bit. Uh, this is our time series, our time periods, and these are our actual demands. So let me um, put down the notations, T, so this is D1, D2, D3, uh, D4, etc. Okay, so uh, F1, F2, F3, F4, okay? So let me start with F4. When n equals 2, we take the average of the most recent two periods. So for period 4, if we're looking at period 4, we go back one period to D3 plus D2 and divide the sum by 2 to take the average. 
Okay? For F3, uh, again, we need the most recent two periods, uh, D2 and D1, divided by 2. So for F2, there is uh, D1 plus D0 divided by 2. However, since we don't have D0, we cannot calculate this forecast. Okay? So this, it doesn't mean this forecast is zero, it's just that we cannot calculate this. Okay? So then for F1, we go back one period, D0, which we don't have, and then we go back two periods, uh, D minus one, which we don't have either. So again, we cannot calculate the first two uh, forecasts. Okay? However, starting from period 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., we can calculate the forecasts. Okay? So let's plug in the numbers. So for F3, we take the average of D1 and D2. Okay? So um, D2 is 2200 plus 1600 divided by 2. Okay, so the average of these two will be equal to uh, F3. So this is going to be uh, 800, okay, uh, 1,900. Okay, so this is the forecast for period uh, three. For period four, uh, we need uh, these two, D3 and D2. D3 is 2,000, um, D2 is 2,200, divided by 2, 2,100, okay? So, and, and this goes on uh, like this uh, further. So, on your own time, you, on your own time, I suggest you just manually uh, fill out these uh, uh, this table uh, with these cells and uh, practice. So this is when n equals to 2. Okay, so let's look at what happens when n equally, when n equals 3. So you can use n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, etc. Okay, the formula is the same. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, take the average of the most recent n observations, okay? So for F3, I'm sorry, this is going to be F4. So for period 4, we need to take the average of the most recent three periods. So if we're looking at 4, we need D3, D2, and D1. Add them up and divide by 3, okay? So this is going to be 2,000, 2,200, 1,600, okay? 2,000, um, 2,200 plus 1,600 uh, divided by 3, okay? So uh, for F3, uh, F2 and F1, we will not have enough data. Okay? Why? So for F3, we will need uh, D2, D1, and D0. Okay? Uh, we have D2 and D1, but we're not, we don't have D0. So we cannot calculate this forecast. Also, we cannot uh, calculate F2 and F1, okay? So this is the basic idea behind the, uh, uh, behind the forecasting method of uh, simple moving average. Simple moving average uh, treats all previous periods equally. So in simple moving average, all previous periods are equally relevant to today and the future.
Okay. So in mathematical terms, um, you apply the same weight to each previous period. Now, this method works well, simple moving average works well, when demand is fairly stable over time. So we have a flat line demand, a constant level, and when you use a lower or higher end, uh, you uh, affect how um, flat or how fluctuating the forecast is. Okay. So, um, and finally, you should not use this method when there is trend or seasonality in the data set. Okay. So let me show you how to use this method um, in Excel. Okay. So uh, on Canvas, I have um, uploaded a file called uh, forecasting.excel, uh, uh, Excel SM or something like that, Excel SM. And it has, uh, you can download it and follow along. So here we have sales data from two companies. One is Benetton. The other company is Levi Strauss. So there are two tabs, Benetton tab and Levi Strauss tab. Okay. So here we have a time series. This is for Benetton. Okay. Uh, so this is the time part. These are the uh, time periods, 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94, etc. And we have the data part, which is the actual sales. Okay, so this is how much Benetton actually sold in these years. Okay, so here I'm using simple moving average, okay, with n equals 2. Okay, so when n equals 2, I cannot forecast the first two periods. So I don't have a forecast for 1990 and 91. However, starting from 1992, I have a forecast. So how did I generate this forecast? I basically took the average of these two numbers and uh, obtained this forecast. So let me... Okay. So here, for this forecast, I took the average of these two numbers and I got this forecast. Okay. Now, for the next forecast, I took the average of these two. For the following forecast, I took the average of these two. For the following forecast, I took the average of these two. So now you can see why this is called moving average. Okay. So uh, then I graphed actual sales and the forecasts. So, so this blue line, let me scroll down a little bit, or maybe move it up a little bit. Okay. So, so these are the years. Uh, so the blue line shows you the uh, actual sales, and the red line is our forecast. Okay. So our forecast doesn't start with the uh, blue line because the first two uh, periods we cannot forecast. So the forecast start with the third period and move on. Okay, so um, it shows you how close the forecast is to the actual blue line, which is actual demand. Okay, so one thing we can do is we can change the number of periods that we use. We can set this equal to 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So let's go from n equals 2 to n equals 3. Okay. So I click this scroll bar. So now we have at n equals 3. Our forecast has changed a little bit. And uh, you can see that we cannot forecast the first n 
the first three periods. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep increasing n. Okay? Now the blue line will never change because that's our actual sale uh, sales, but uh, uh, the the red line will change. Our forecast will change because we're going to use more and more and more periods. Now the question is, as we increase n, is our forecast going to be smoother, or are we going to see more fluctuations as we increase n? What do you think? Okay. So let's let's do this. So let's go uh, and increase n to 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So now uh, we're using the most recent 8 periods to, to forecast, and our uh, forecast looks almost like a flat line. What this means is that the forecast is not responsive to fluctuations. Okay? It captures the trend, but it's not responsive. The forecast, the, the actual can go up or down, but the forecast remains fairly smooth. Okay? So let's go back and decrease the number of periods that we use. So uh, I go to 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, okay? So now uh, the forecast is using only the most recent two periods, and there's much more fluctuation because it responds to a greater degree to the changes in demand, okay? So when you use a few uh, recent periods, the forecast will respond to the changes in demand. However, when you increase the number of recent periods that you use, the forecast will not be uh, as fluctuating. It's going to be smoother. Um, so in practice, should you use a high end or a low end? Which one is better? The answer is yes. So if you uh, if you are only uh, if you only care about the actual trend and if you don't want to bother about the um, daily ups and downs, okay. If you are concerned about the long term trend, you should use a high end, which doesn't respond much to daily ups and downs. However, if you want to keep up to date as much as possible. If the short-term ups and downs are important to you, then you want to use a lower N. Okay. So so this is uh, the simple moving average. Now uh, let's talk about another method. called um, weighted moving average, okay. weighted moving average. <coughs> Excuse me. The formulas are again boring, so I'm just going to skip the formulas. So uh, this is just like simple moving average. However, each period has a weight. Okay. So if you're using n equals 2, you're using the most recent two periods, you need to have two weights. If you're using n equals three, three most recent periods, you need to have three weights. n equals four, you need to have four weights. Okay? So you're assigning a different weight for each period. Okay? So for example, this is n equals two, we're going to use two most recent periods. So for each period, we need a weight, okay? So W1 and W2. So uh, when we use our formula, uh, what's going to happen is we, we're going to go back one period, use this weight, and then we're going to uh, we're gonna go back two periods and then use this weight. 
Why are we as, uh, assigning different weights to recent periods? Why are we not assigning the same weight to each period? Uh, the reason is more recent periods may be more important to you, so you want to emphasize them more, you want to give them more weight, and periods farther in the past may not be as important or as relevant to you, so you want to de-emphasize them and give them uh, lower weights. Okay, so uh, let's do this example. Here, uh, we're using n equals 2, the most recent two periods. And for each of these two periods, we have a weight. So here, we go back one period. Here, we go back two periods, okay? And the weights add up to 1, 60% plus 40%. So the most recent period has a weight of 60% and the uh, forecast uh, or, the, or the period farther in the past has a lower uh, weight, 40%. Uh, since n equals 2, we cannot generate forecasts for the first two periods. However, starting from period 3, uh, F3, F4, F5, we can start generating forecasts. So for uh, forecast 3, uh, we go back one period, W1, to period 2. Okay? So 1 means you go back one period, so W1 times D2 plus W2, W2 means you're going back two periods to D1, okay? So for F4, W1, so we go back from 4 to 3, D3, plus W2, we're going back two periods from 4 to 2, D2, okay? Uh, F5, W1 times D4, plus W2 times D3, etc. Okay? So, so this is how you implement weighted moving average. So you're, again, using N most recent periods. However, instead of um, um, simply averaging them, you multiply each period by a particular weight. So, so let's see how we do this in Excel, okay? So here we have uh, here we have an example of uh, weighted moving average. Uh, we're uh, using n equals two. For example, you can have you can use n equals 3, but then you need to have 3 weights. You can use n equals 4, then you need to have 4 weights, etc. So, uh, initially, uh, our, period, uh, our weight W1 is 80%. Our uh, second weight is 20%. Okay? Since n equals 2, we don't have forecasts for the first two periods. However, starting from the third period, we generate our forecasts, okay? So, um, let's change the weights. Um, so, I'm going down to 70, 30, um, 60, 40, 50, 50. Now, at 50, 50, our forecasts are going to be the same as the simple moving average, okay? Going back, uh, let's say, uh, 40, 60, 70, 30, 80, 20, 80, 10, 90, etc. So, which weights should you use in real life? In other words, which weights give you the best forecast? Now, in forecasting, usually there is no theory. It's all applied. So what that means is that you need to try different values of uh, 
your parameters. You, you use different way to use different number of periods and see which one gives you the best forecast. Okay, and then you pick that set of values, those parameter values, and then uh, generate forecasts for the future. Okay, so this brings us to how we measure forecast quality. So going back to our uh, simple moving average, we generated forecasts with n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, but which n? gives us the best forecast. Which end gives us the highest forecast quality? Okay. So for that reason, we try different ends. And for each end, we calculate forecast quality. So going back. Okay. Now, uh, in this section, I want to talk about forecast quality and how we measure it. Uh, forecast quality has two dimensions. Okay? The first dimension is accuracy. Accuracy means how close is your forecast to the actual value. Okay? So the closer, your, to the, the closer the forecast to the actual, the higher the accuracy. And then the second thing is bias. Are your forecasts biased? What does it, what does it mean to be uh, for a forecast to be biased or unbiased? So when you generate forecasts, you will have errors. Okay. So uh, sometimes you will over forecast. Sometimes you will under forecast. Okay. An unbiased forecast is roughly uh, half the time above, half the time below the actual. Okay, So unbiasedness means you over forecast about half the time and you under forecast about half the time. Okay, A biased forecast could be when you're usually over forecasting or under forecasting. Okay, that's that's bias. Okay, so uh, Every measure of forecast accuracy and bias uh, depend on the forecast error. And the formula for forecast error is this, uh, E error, forecast error, for period T is uh, actual demand minus forecast. Okay? This is your forecast error. Now, I don't like this measure because it's counterintuitive. Why is it counterintuitive? It's counterintuitive because when you over forecast, okay, it gives you a negative error. Over forecasting means forecast is greater than the actual. So actual minus the forecast will give you a negative error. And that means you're over forecasting. Typically, uh, people think over forecasting gives you a positive error. However, using this formula, over forecasting gives you a negative error. And in the same way, when you under forecast, when your forecast is below actual demand, the forecast error will be positive, which indicates you're under forecasting. So that's why this formula is counterintuitive. However, why do we use this formula if it's counterintuitive? The simple reason is everybody uses this formula. All textbooks, you know, all academic work, practical work, everybody uses this formula. So as a result, we're stuck with this formula. Okay. So, uh, so let's talk about specific measures of forecast quality. So the first uh, measure of forecast quality is mean forecast error. Okay, mean forecast error. So to calculate this, you uh, calculate the forecast error for each period and take the average of your uh, uh, 
forecast errors. So let me give you an example here. Okay. So, so this is our time series, our actual demand data. These are our forecasts. So for each period, we can calculate our forecast error. Okay. The formula is dt minus ft, actual minus forecast. So for period three, our forecast error will be actual minus uh, forecast minus 20. For period four, actual minus forecast 15. For period five, actual minus uh, forecast is our forecast error. So here we have a negative error. That means we must be over forecasting. That means our forecast must be too high. Actually, our forecast is higher than the actual demand. Here we have a positive error. Positive means you're under forecasting. Okay. So that means your, um, uh, uh, your forecast is too low. And actually, our forecast is lower than the actual. Okay. And here, zero means you're spot on, 80, 80. Okay. So these are our forecast errors. Now, uh, when we take the average of these forecast errors, we get the mean forecast error. So we take the average of these three numbers, we add them up and divide by three. And this is our uh, mean forecast error. Mean forecast error does not measure accuracy. It measures bias. Okay, so if your forecast is unbiased, you should have roughly equal amounts of positive and negative errors. And when you add them up and divide by the number of observations, the positive and negative errors should cancel each other out. And so an unbiased forecast will be closer to zero. However, if you have more positive errors or more negative errors, okay, uh, the average will be uh, either greater than zero or less than zero, okay? So uh, when you look at mean forecast error, you can compare two error, uh, two, two forecasts, okay? So you can co uh, uh, compute the mean forecast error for n equals two and n equals three and calculate mean forecast error for each n. And the, the n, that gives you a smaller mean forecast error that's closer to zero, is less biased. Okay, we're gonna do an example of this. Uh, so, so let's do an example, actually, let's do it right now. Let's go to our uh, Excel uh, file. Uh, here, uh, we have the actuals, and then we have the forecasts. So to calculate the errors, here, I have taken uh, actual minus uh, the uh, forecast. This is our error for these years. Okay? So for each year, I have taken the actual minus forecast, actual minus forecast, actual minus forecast, and I got these errors, okay? So to calculate the mean forecast error, I need to take the average of this column, okay? So let me uh, hide some of the, uh, or maybe let's, let's go to here, uh, let's say, uh, 50, okay, um, um, yeah, okay, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm just going to hide some of these uh, rows, okay, 
So here, when n equals 2, uh, the mean forecast error is 54. Now let's increase n to 3 and see what happens to this number. When I increase n to 3, okay, for n equals 3, the mean forecast error is 94. So we've gone away from 0, so we're more biased. n equals 2 gives you less biased forecasts. n equals 3 gives you more biased forecasts. Uh, let's go to n equals 4. Uh, so mean forecast error jumped to 142, even more biased. Okay. So let's go to n equals 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. So in this particular case, this may not always be true, but as we increase n, uh, our forecasts are more and more and more biased. Okay. So solely in terms of bias, n equals to 2 is best, solely in terms of bias. Now let's calculate, uh, let's look at uh, accuracy, okay? So mean forecast error is a measure of bias. Mean forecast error is a measure of bias. It doesn't measure accuracy. Why doesn't it measure accuracy? It doesn't measure accuracy because uh, forecasts, uh, positive and negative forecasts cancel out each other. Okay. So uh, in order to calculate, calculate the uh, accuracy, we need to get rid of positive and negative error terms. One way to do that is to take the absolute value of forecast errors, okay? Absolute value of the forecast errors. So what's the absolute value of a number? If a number is a, posit is a positive number, it stays positive, but the absolute value of a negative number will become positive, okay? So uh, to give you an example here, so, so these are our forecast errors, and then we take their absolute values. Uh, this is the, these, this is the uh, notation for absolute value, two bars, okay? Absolute value of minus 20 is 20. Absolute value of 15 is 15. Absolute value of zero is zero. And when we take the absolute value of our forecasts, there are no negative numbers. They're all, they're all positive or zero, okay? Nothing cancels out anything else, okay? So to take the average, we add up these three numbers and divide them by three. And this is our mean absolute deviation which is a measure of accuracy, which is a measure of how close our forecasts are to the actual. So 11.67, what does that mean? That means on average, uh, we are off by this much, okay? In the positive or the negative direction, but on average, this is how big our error will be. Uh, if we randomly pick a uh, period and look at our forecast error, the average will be this in the positive or negative direction. On average, 11.67. So let's see how we do this in Excel. Okay. So I go back. So I have the uh, error. So uh, these are our raw errors. Okay, and uh, let me unhide these columns. One second. So, okay. So, this is uh, our error column. Okay, and then here we take the absolute values of these errors. 
So positive numbers stay positive, but if you have a negative number, it becomes positive. So under the absolute error column, everything's positive. Okay. So and then we take the average of these uh, absolute errors. So let me hide some of these columns. Okay. So our uh, mean absolute deviation, so this is the average of absolute errors, so mean absolute deviation, which is a measure of accuracy, okay, is 295. This is the average size of our errors, okay, and this is when n equals 8. Now, let's decrease n and see if the average size of errors increases or decreases. So I'm going to n equals uh, 7, okay, n equals 6, n equals 5, n equals 4, n equals 3, and n equals 2, okay. Of all those numbers, n equals 2 gives us the smallest average error, lowest mean absolute deviation. So in terms of accuracy, n equals 2 gives us the best uh, forecast quality. Okay? In terms of bias, n equals 2 was also the least biased, and we now see it's the least uh, uh, inaccurate. Okay, so it's highest, it gives us the highest accuracy and the lowest bias. Okay. So, another way of looking at accuracy is to square the error terms. Instead of taking the absolute value, we can square the error terms, okay? So we take the square of each error term and then take the average of the square errors, which gives us the mean squared error, okay? So when you square, square a number, uh, positive numbers remain positive, uh, negative numbers give you a positive square, okay? So again, Everything will be positive. Nothing's going to cancel out anything else. Okay. So let's see an example of this here. Okay. So these are our actual errors here. And these are our squared errors. So minus 20 squared gives us 400. 15 squared gives us 225, 0 squared gives us 0, okay? To find the mean squared error, we need to take the average of these three squared errors. So we add them up. Uh, okay. So, so we add up the three squared errors and divide by 3, because we have three numbers that we're averaging. And this is the mean squared error. This is another measure of accuracy. Okay. However, probably the most popular measure of accuracy is called MAPE. Okay. Okay. So, so what is MAPE? MAPE stands for Mean Absolute Percentage Error. So to calculate MAPE, you first take the absolute value of the error term and divide it by the actual. So this uh, quotient gives you what percent of you are. Okay? Instead of being X units off, you are off by this percent. Okay, so let's look at a simple example here. Okay, 
So we have the absolute error here, and we have the actual. To calculate main, we, we uh, take the absolute error, 20, divide by the actual 70, okay? 20 over 70 is uh, 29%. So in this period, we were off by 29%. Let's look at the next period. In the next period, we were off by 15, absolute error. 15 divided by the actual 90, 15 over 90, gives us 17%. So in this period, we were off by 17%. Uh, in the following period, we were off by 0, 0 over 80, 80 is the actual, we were off by 0%. So on average, what percent are we off? So we take the uh, average of these three percentage uh, absolute errors, okay? So we add them up and divide by three. So on any given period, we're off by 15%, okay? So we can do all of these in Excel very easily, where, uh, so here we have our uh, squared error column, okay? So how do, how do I get the squares? I simply look at the error, let's say in this particular case, minus 210, okay? Minus 210 squared is this. This is minus 250. Minus 250 squared is this. 328 squared is this. 694 squared is this. So these are all our squared errors. And their average is the mean squared error. Let's go to main. Okay. So for main... Uh, I look at the absolute error, 210, divided by the actual, this is the actual, gives me uh, 12%. So I'm off by 12%. Okay. The following period, I was off by 250. 250 divided by the actual gives me uh, 16%. The following period, I'm, I'm off by three to, uh, uh, 238 divided by the actual, okay, gives me 9%. Okay, so on and so forth. And then I average these, uh, uh, these percentages and I'm off by 10% on average. Okay. So, so uh, this is how you calculate uh, a measure of bias, mean forecast error. Mean forecast error is a measure of bias. And then, to measure accuracy, you can use either mean absolute deviation, mean squared error, or uh, mean absolute percentage error made. There are also many other measures of accuracy and bias. However, these are the most popular ones.